Hey gang, and welcome to the lecture on fairy tales. Let me just say, it is heartbreaking that we don't get to have this discussion in class. These tales are wild, and it sucks to not really get to dive into them the way that we have all semester. But such is the situation, and we must soldier on. So, here's how this lecture is going to go. First, I'm going to discuss those daily key quotes a little bit more in depth, and then I'll get into the tales themselves. I won't be going through the entirety of the tales, that would bore even me to tears, so I'm just going to hit the highlights of each one and maybe deep dive a quote or two, and then one of the key quotes for each tale. If you'd like to discuss the tales in greater detail with me, I encourage you to email me, as I am happy to discuss it more. Alrighty, so let's hop into it. As I mentioned earlier, your daily key quotes for the rest of the semester are going to be coming from academic research sources. We will be fo focusing on how to properly implement research into your writing for this essay, so this method should give you some solid practice. This first quote is from Jack Zipes, one of the leading literary scholars on fairy tale. He explains, quote, Myths and fairy tales seem to know something we do not know. We keep returning to them for answers. We refer to myths and fairy tales as lies by saying, oh, that's just a fairy tale, or that's just a myth, but these lies are often the lies that govern our lives. Here, Zipes is not just justifying why fairy tales and myths are so important, but drawing attention to the effect that they have on our actual lives. This idea that we keep coming back to fairy tales, that they know something we don't, calls attention to the fact that, for whatever reason, these tales and their concepts persist and we see them infiltrate almost every aspect of popular media, from films and video games to mascots on cereal boxes. There's something intrinsic about the tales that resonates with us, and Zipes identifies that there at the end of his quote. These lies, which, we, which was the claim that fairy tales are simply stories, are actually stories that govern the way that we behave. These concepts have so integrated into our collective psyche that they control the way that we interpret media, people, even our own interactions. So what Zipes is addressing here is that though these tales are often discounted as just stories, they do so much more than simply entertain us. Fairy tales present to us a boiled down, almost raw, symbolic representation of the world so that we can better digest those concepts. Our other two quotes do a great job of building on this concept, so let's hop over to the next one. The next quote comes from Deirdre Baker, who is widely published on fairy tale criticism. This quote, in fact, comes from her definition of fantasy in a cornerstone text for children's literature criticism. Though the entry is for fantasy, she applies much of it to fairy tales as well throughout her explanation. She claims, quote, Such fantasy acknowledges the inability of language to convey fully the puzzling aspects of being human. At the same time, it acknowledges the supreme fitness of fantasy, of metaphor, as the best means through which to explore and attempt to understand them. Here, Baker is putting a lot of emphasis on how fairy tales give us the means to understand difficult concepts that otherwise elude language. How exactly can you put into words that you feel nervous about something like getting married, or trying to understand why your child is sick, or feeling like someone who should be protecting you like a parent may not have your best interests at heart? Those are tough concepts, but Baker explains that fantasy and fairy tales specifically give us the means to parse out those puzzling aspects. Fairy tales give us the language, the metaphor, for dealing with those tough concepts, like wicked stepmothers or being transformed into frogs. In reality, step-parents or anyone who is in, uh, introduced to an established relationship aren't wicked, but their arrival brings with them a time of adjustment, and often at least some conflict which one must overcome. We don't turn into frogs when we go through puberty, but our bodies do change, and to a child that transformation can be as dramatic as sprouting scales. In this way, fairy tales are supremely fit to divide a provide us with the language and means to cope with these issues by giving us hyperbolic metaphor, which we can digest without the anxiety brought on by our reality. So our last quote also builds on this concept, so let's move over there now. Maria Tatar is an extraordinary writer and is the editor for the Norton Critical Edition collection of fairy tales. Norton is the company that put your textbook together, so she's kind of a big deal. Her quote here comes from the introduction to that fairy tales collection. She claims, quote, fairy tales register an effort on the part of both women and men to develop maps for coping with personal anxieties, family conflicts, social frictions, and the myriad frustrations of everyday life. 
like our other two critics, Tatar here is identifying why exactly these tales were written, and by extension, why we keep returning to them. These tales are evidence of an effort to map those anxieties, to give us a means to navigate everything from highly personal family conflicts to far-reaching social frictions, and even the smaller mundane frustrations of just being human. Tatar puts very plainly the situations we see pop up most in fairy tales, and identifies that the very fact that these anxieties continue to appear suggests that we as people are still dealing with them. Sure, arranged marriages aren't much of a thing anymore, and you likely won't see something as miraculous as a winged man in your backyard, but our responses to those moments or the anxieties such situations dredge up can be applied to very modern problems. So we will be returning to these quotes as we work through these tales, so keep your notes handy. All right, so now let's move into the tales proper. Let's start with Gabriel Garcia Marquez's fairy tale, A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings, which was written in 1955. Much of Marquez's writing incorporates elements of magical realism, which the story does as well, but the treatment of the story's moral quandaries settle it nicely in fairy tale territory. In the story, a couple, Peleo and Elisanda, are anxious over their child's worsening illnesses. One day, they are shocked when an old, decrepit, winged man lands in their backyard. Though they've prayed for some miracle for their child, this tattered old man isn't exactly what they had in mind, and so they become frustrated by his lackluster appearance and see the man as more of a burden, or at least an opportunity for wealth, rather than revere him as an angel. This tale deals a lot with expectations and the miraculous. When people think about a miracle, they have a very specific version of what that means. The dead suddenly coming back to life, the blind suddenly being able to see, getting a buggy at Walmart whose wheels don't squeak or get stuck. So when these people, and eventually the rest of the town, find this angel who doesn't fit their expectations of what an angel is or should be, they get angry, greedy, man, petty. Man, there are so many scenes in the story that I really want to dive into. But I promise to keep this short, and I'm already going to break that promise. So I'll zoom in on the scene with the priest first, and we'll hop through two other quick points. The local priest, Father Gonzaga, claims to be an authority on what is or isn't an angel. His background as a woodcutter obviously makes him an expert. So he just hops right on in that chicken coop and starts spouting Latin. Naturally, Latin is the language of God, because that's what the Hebrew people spoke in the Old Testament. It's not. And definitely what Jesus spoke, also not true. So, in this scene, we have someone discredit this obvious angel because the old man doesn't speak the language that the priest expects him to uh, speak. A language which is, for all intents and purposes, arbitrary to the reality of the situation. This dude has wings! He is obvi an angel. But he's not fitting into the very small box of what the priest expects an angel to be, so he's not. From there, the story takes a kind of depressing turn as the couple sets up a freak show sort of attraction and charge admission for their neighbors. Eventually, the entire neighborhood came to Gawka the Angel, quote, without the slightest reverence, as if he weren't a supernatural creature but a circus animal. Here, the neighbors treat the angel with derision, throwing scraps of food and goading a response. They have come to see the miracle, but not with awe and reverence, rather like a heckling crowd who was who is here to watch a caged animal turn tricks. More significantly, they have been charged admission by the couple, like one would be at a circus, and as such they feel entitled to a sort of show, rather than simply observing something miraculous, a freaking angel. But the end of the story is the big kicker. The family has made a mint off of this old man. They've got a nice two-story house, their kid isn't sick anymore, they've made it big. All on the back of this old man with enormous wings. At the end of the tale, Elisanda, the wife, watches the angel struggle to fly and, when he finally succeeds, does not respond with rapture, but relief. Quote, because then he was no longer an annoyance in her life, but an imaginary dot on the horizon of the sea. Despite the fact that this couple has made a mint off of the angel and now live in luxury, free from the troubles that they had at the beginning of the tale, Elisanda never saw the angel as anything but an annoyance, something that caused her strife rather than ultimately bringing her prosperity. Because the angel was not the glorious thing she had imagined, she derided it and shunned it, being glad at the end that it was out of her life rather than thankful for the miraculous gift she unwittingly received. So what the heck do we do with this tale? Well, luckily for us, Deidre Baker is here to help us out. 
According to Baker, quote, fantasy acknowledges the inability of language to convey fully the puzzling aspect of being human. Life is indeed puzzling, and in its way miraculous. People see incredible acts of kindness, talent, and wonder at almost every turn. Some attribute it to a higher power, while others just chalk it up to sheer human ingenuity. But ultimately, humans are faster to ridicule something for not living up to their expectations than being thankful for what they do have, and they are even faster to deny such. In the same way, the townspeople in Marquez's fantasy tale have a very specific idea of what an angel should be. So when one is put in their path, they criticize and nitpick and argue over whether it is a miracle at all instead of accepting and embracing it on its own terms. In this way, Marquez uses fantasy to argue that humanity wouldn't know a miracle if they saw one, despite knowing what an angel is and looks like, but they would rather tear it down or at worst exploit it. The otherwise difficult concept is made simpler when cast in a fairy tale or fantasy setting, as Baker would suggest. Okay, I have to stop. I could talk about this story for ages. If you want to talk more about it, shoot me that email. Otherwise, let's hop over to Little Red Riding Hood. Charles Perrault is a French author who lived between 1628 and 1703. He is one of the earliest writers of fairy tales, and his versions are often the ones that we think of, namely Little Red Riding Hood, Cinderella, and especially Sleeping Beauty. In Perrault's version of Red Riding Hood, which was the original one, coming about 100 years or so before the Brothers Grimm version, it does not feature a rescue for the titular little girl, as you probably were expecting when you were reading this. Rather, this tale is a purely cautionary one, and when you dive into it a bit more, you see that the wolf isn't so much the villain as everyone as was everyone else's lack of caution. You're familiar enough with the story, so I'm going to skip the summary. Let's hop right into it. When the neighbor wolf meets Little Red in the forest, Red freely gives the wolf whatever information he asks for. Notice the wolf then uses that information back verbatim in two separate occasions. When Red tells him, quote, I'm going to see my grandmother and taking her some cakes and a little pot of butter sent by my mother. The wolf goes to the grandmother's house and says the line back exactly as Red said it. After the grandmother tells the wolf how to get into the house, mistake number two, the wolf then says the exact same thing back to Red when she arrives. Quote, pull the door, pull the bolt and the latch will open. With this structure in mind, it's clear the wolf isn't a criminal mastermind. If so, he probably would have done this long before, as the text says he hadn't eaten in three days. But rather, the wolf takes advantage of those who freely give out pertinent information. And even though Perot says that the that little red, quote, didn't know that it was dangerous to stop and listen to wolves, the real danger here is that no one told Red not to give out her freaking GPS coordinates and social security number to some rando in the woods. So you might be thinking, I would never give my information to some shady-ass rando. But this tale is more than its surface appearance. The fact that, probably more than any other single fairy tale, the story of Little Red Riding Hood is constantly being adapted and re-envisioned means that there's something going on here. There's something that we keep needing to learn and needing to hear. And that's exactly what Jack Zeitz is talking about. When he says that these lies, meaning these stories and fairy tales, govern our lives, he's talking about the way that they inform our worldview and change or should change our actions. Now, more than ever, we should be cautious of the information we share with others. I chose the Perot version of the tale because Red doesn't get rescued. There's a cost to her ignorance and naivete. She did. And so the story becomes a cautionary tale. But the question remains, whom is this tale trying to caution? Is it Red to not randomly give out information to strangers or to stray from the path? Sure. Or could it be the mother who never taught her child such a valuable lesson? Fairy tales, like all children's literature, have a dual audience. You have to think about not only the child who is hearing or reading the story, but also the adult who is often reading the story to the child, or at the very least, has had some hand in choosing the story for the child to read. Therefore, messages for fairy tales and children's literature can be as much for the kid as it is for the adult. We'll see this a lot more in Winnie the Pooh, but it's a good thing to kind of keep an eye on as we go through. Whew, okay, let's hop to Hansel and Gretel next. So if you guys know any of these author dudes, you've probably heard of the Brothers Grimm, two German academics who collected European folk tales in the early 1800s and published them for the first time in two large volumes. 
the brothers converted oral tales spoken aloud by families for generations into a written format, which necessitated a certain level of editorializing. But if nothing else, it ensured that these tales endured, and their practice set the groundwork for not only collection of fairy tales and folklore, and folklore but also its academic study. They, like, like Zipes, knew that there was a reason that these stories kept persisting. And so the fact of their collection here gives weight to exploring these tales more thoroughly as a means to understand human nature. So you're probably familiar, too, with the tale of Hansel and Gretel, though you might have missed some of the specific details. The big one that no one ever seems to remember is the theme that I'm going to focus on here, and it's that the children's stepmother is actively trying to kill these kids. The evil stepmother trope is well established, but in this fairy tale, the figure of the stepmother takes on an even more powerful menace. Hansel and Gretel's stepmother is horribly wicked. She frequently spouts the need to be rid of the kids so that she and her husband can survive the famine. Now, during this time period, this was a very valid concern for families, that if the family was too big, there were just too many mouths to feed. That's not so much a modern concern, but the fact that it is the stepmother's plan is significant. She was an intruder to the family. Hansel and Gretel aren't her kids, so she doesn't have any skin in their game. She's an outsider, and a dangerous one. And the fairy tale works that concept through a fairly classic metaphor. Once the children are really lost in the woods, they find a house made of sweets. Inside is an old witch who, after sweet-talking the kids, locks them up with the intention to eat them. Hmm. So, a wicked old hermit who lives in the woods... A literal outsider lures Hansel and Gretel in with literal sweets. Hmm. Their stepmother, you remember, attempted to be sweet by saying the children could rest in the woods while she and her father, she and their father, chop wood. The similarities between the stepmother and the old witch are significant. They each call the children lazy bones and enjoy ordering the children around. When the kids actually kill the old witch and make it back home to their father, the stepmother is mysteriously gone. His wife has died, is all the text says. Hansel and Gretel's killing of the old witch is the symbolic killing of their stepmother. Now, hopefully at least, modern children don't have to worry about stepmothers trying to kill them off. But the anxiety of having someone new into your family unit, an outsider, is still very threatening. As Baker claims, these tales present, quote, the supreme fitness of fantasy, of metaphor, as the best means through which to explore and attempt to understand those puzzling human scenarios. This tale uses metaphor, the witch's sweet house, which hides her true intentions, to exemplify the uncomfortable truth that sometimes those who should protect us do not always have our best interests at heart. Or at the very least, that's an assumption one must in some way work through. I'm certainly not saying that every step-parent is even, or I wouldn't even say most step-parents are, trying to do something bad to their children. But the potential for that creates anxiety within the child and adults alike, which they both must work through. So consider that dual audience again. The child's moral is pretty obvious. Don't eat random people's houses and don't let anyone know you're getting fat. But the moral for adults could be perhaps that Situations such as these create anxiety for children, and the adult must not use honey words to bribe the child into liking them. Rather, be genuine. If you want to kill off the kids, just tell them so. No, wait, sorry. I've obviously being a little glib here because I've been writing this PowerPoint lecture for seven hours. But the message here could easily be that step parents perhaps should be aware of the anxiety their arrival may cause, and they should do their best to not be duplicitous, even with good intentions. There's a lot you could do here with the dual audience, and if that's something you're into, just shoot me an email. But otherwise, we need to hop over to Bluebeard. This story is wild. I love it. Once again, written by Perot, this one was published in 1697. The story tells about a man with a blue beard who marries wife after wife and kills them because they have broken some arbitrary rule which turns their own curiosity against them. At its core, the story resonates most within the confines of arranged marriages. During this time period, young girls were married off for a variety of reasons and rarely knew their husbands at all. This was terrifying because, holy crap, what if my husband is a murderer? How would I even know? There is also considerable critical work done about the story as one of the terrifying prospects of a girl going through puberty for the first time, as would be represented by the blood which could not be washed away. 
This moment in a girl's life signifies her biological maturation and was often when young girls were immediately married off. So having your period meant you could have a baby. So off you go to do just that. What a terrifying prospect. So this fairy tale really attempts to work through that anxiety, but has an interesting overall moral as well. Speaking of moral, let's look at that moral at the end of the tale. Quote, Curiosity, in spite of its many charms, can bring with it serious regrets. You can see a thousand examples of it every day. Women succumb, but it's a fleeting pleasure. As soon as you satisfy it, it ceases to be, and it always proves very, very costly. There's a lot you can do with that moral, not the least of which call it kind of sexist. If one is to take Perot at his word here, which there's plenty of people who consider this a satirical moment, it would suggest that this tale is about following the rules, especially you young ladies in the audience. But when you break the story down, you see that it would actually encourage the exact opposite. Bluebeard has killed multiple women so far, and no one has done anything about it because no one discovered it. The final wife, who breaks the inhuman mandate of whatever you do, do not touch that red button, is the one who reveals Bluebeard to be the monster that he is. If society tells women, you're supposed to listen to your husbands no matter what, that gives men quite a long leash to play with. By that logic, the woman absolutely should have been punished for opening the room, which revealed the pools of blood and dead women who Bluebeard had murdered. This tale seems to call attention to the dangers of such blatant subservience. Now, you may be thinking, but Mr. Yao, that's exactly what the moral says. Ah, yes it is. But then look at that second moral. It says, quote, No longer are husbands so terrible, demanding the impossible, acting unhappy and jealous. Even considering that for a second would make almost anyone say, um, false. There are plenty of cases, even now, when husbands don't toe the line with their wives. And that certainly was the case during Perot's time. Though society and religion would have liked everyone else to believe otherwise. So this story is an amazing example of Tatar's point in her quote, where she says, quote, Fairy tales register an effort on the part of both women and men to develop maps for coping with personal anxieties, family conflicts, social frictions, and the myriad frustrations of everyday life. The fairy tale has it all. And the complicated presentation of the morals at the end of the tale may suggest the careful dance one might have to do to subvert society's expectations, those frictions, in order to survive and be happy. The tale deals with the personal anxieties and family conflicts of marriage, and even the mundane frustrations of, oh, I have the entire world with before me, but I want to know what's behind that door. It's a remarkably human story in the guise of a barely believable situation. But when you open it up beyond its bare writing, you can see that ugly mirror that it's trying to hold up to society. Whew, man, that was a long one. Super sorry about that. But I hope you enjoyed the discussion. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to email me. Remember, your fairy tale assignment is due this Friday at 11.59 p.m., so do your best to get that wrapped up. Next week, we are moving on to research and Winnie the Pooh, so get pumped, and I'll see you then.